Uh, good morning. I have titled our message this morning, Suffering and Glory on this post-spring break Sunday. You might be wondering that maybe that's weird after spring break, uh, but let me share with you. Some of you were fortunate enough to take a trip for spring break. Uh, maybe some of you are going to listen to this online because you're still on your trip, and so you'll be able to listen to it then. Maybe there are a few of you that uh, stayed in town, but you were very mindful to do little excursions each day. We'll go on a hike this day. We'll go on a bike ride that day, whatever that looks like. Or then there's the fourth category of people that my family finds itself in, uh, the family that did not go on a trip, the family that did not do well with excursions, but rather did things around the house to get our house in order for the rest of 2023, right? And uh, with that being said, there were three little boys in our house that were needing to be cared for all day, every day, while work and everything is still going on. So cue the suffering uh, that was spring break. But tomorrow they go back to school, and so that will bring glory, all right? No, I'm kidding. Uh, the title, that's a joke. We had a great week. I, I pray you guys had a great week with your families as well, if you had some time off. Um, the title of this, this message really is Suffering and Glory, and it has nothing to do with spring break, uh, but it has everything to do with what I think Peter is wanting his readers to understand in this section that we're in today. Um, I don't know about you, but I have really enjoyed our Unfading Hope series, right? And after today, we have four more weeks and we will finish First Peter, right? And so that's pretty exciting to think about. Don't get too excited because as John shared with the announcements, we're going to take two weeks off from First Peter. We're going to talk through uh, Holy Week, Passion Week, Palm Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, and then we'll get back to First Peter. So it's four more messages in the next six weeks, all right? And then we'll be finished with First Peter. But um, I've really enjoyed it, and I hope you guys have as well because it's been rewarding. It's been challenging. It has been wildly important, and, and hopefully it's brought encouragement over the past couple of months as we've walked through this, uh, this letter. And so today there's, there's this new section we're going to jump into where Peter, I uh, want to remind you that, that, and remind all of us that he is speaking to these elect exiles, these Gentile Christians. And so previously, the other two sections of the letter, we have seen a couple things. Uh, one, Peter talked to his readers and told them who they were and, and what they had been given, right? That you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession that has been called out of darkness. You have a, a living hope and an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. You're living stones, God's people. And because of this, we're called to be holy, to hope fully, to fear the Father with reverence, to love one another, and to long for new things, right? Long for the pure spiritual Milk, really that, that first section was everything that we need to understand that, that God has blessed his people in an incredible way. And in the next section of this letter, we stepped into learning how we're meant to conduct ourselves in the face of suffering, in the midst of challenges, right? What does it look like realistically to, to walk through these challenging times? How do we apply all this to our current situation? And Peter, he got particular with a few things, husbands and wives, culture, government, what it looks like to suffer for doing good, and, and how we're meant to live for God, really what our conduct is meant to be in the midst of suffering. And like I said, it's been, it's been challenging to walk through, but it has been encouraging. And I think it's helped us to, to gain the proper perspective on, on all of this with regards to suffering. I think that's what today's passage is going to do as well. Help us understand the correct perspective that we need to have as we suffer. And so I'm going to pray and then we'll be able to uh, get into the passage today. So let's go ahead and pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for an opportunity to open your word and to learn from you. God, I ask that you would uh, speak through me, that my words would be your words, that you would open our hearts, you would open our minds, that you would encourage us uh, to step into what it looks like to suffer for our faith, God, and, and, and the ways in which we might be able to bring you glory through it. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, go ahead and open up your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4 is where we're going to be at, and we're going to start in verse 12, and we're just going to go through three verses, 12, 13, and 14. All right, you can follow along on the screen if you do not have a Bible this morning. But Peter says, 
beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And so as Peter starts this, this next section, he begins similarly with something we, we talked about a little while ago. He calls them something. He reminds them of their identity. He calls them beloved, right? And we, we talked about this, but the whole idea, if you missed that, uh, that message, the whole idea was that our conduct as Christians should flow from our identity as Christians, right? The way in which we handle ourselves should flow from who we are called to be. And so he reminds them that they're loved. You are dearly loved by God. And so maybe this is your first time here, and, and that's, that's what I want you to hear. You are loved by God. Don't forget that, right? We're going to need to cling to that, especially as we walk through suffering. So he points that out. After he reminds his readers of their identity, uh, we see that he, again, is going into this idea of suffering. He's kind of doubling down on suffering. We've been talking all about suffering, and now he's going to continue to talk about suffering. And there are a couple different ideas as to, to why. One of them, uh, reasons that he's doubling down, is it could be in preparation for what is to come for the early church. Right? John spoke of this a few weeks back, but um, as soon as Christianity was no longer seen as just a sect of Judaism— and it was its own religion, all of a sudden persecution came, heavily under Emperor Nero. And, and so some people would say that's my, that might be what, what Peter is referring to, right? That it's, it's going to get worse, and so we're going to double down on our understanding of suffering. Uh, another thought um, is that we need to be reminded, like I said, that Peter is writing to Gentile Christians, right? When we think of persecution and we think of the Jewish people, we know that they are some of the most persecuted people in history, right? Peter is not writing to Jewish Christians. He's writing to Gentile Christians who maybe they don't understand this as much. And so we need to unpack this idea of persecution a little bit more. And maybe that's important for us today. Because when I, when I began to work through this passage, my thought was, again, we're still going to talk about suffering? And maybe you're sitting there like, really, again? Well, yeah, we're going to. There's a reason that Peter continues to double down, right? And it's applicable for us, right? If it's because things were going to get worse for the early church, well, things are going to get worse for us. Face it, right? If it was because the Gentile Christians didn't understand persecution the way that the Jewish Christians did, I would want to step out and say, we don't quite understand persecution in the American church the way that other Christians do in the world. And so either way, it's going to be applicable to us, and so I want to step into that today, and that's why we're going to double down, okay? So two big takeaways that I want to get from uh, these couple of verses. Uh, first one comes from verse number 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Right, the first thing that I think we need to understand is we need to expect suffering. We need to expect suffering, and oftentimes we don't. Peter said, don't be surprised, or to put it plainly, expect it. This is not something strange that is happening to you as a follower of Jesus. Let's go all the way back to the fall. In Genesis chapter 3, Satan, in the form of a serpent, comes to Adam and Eve and deceives them into believing that God is holding out on them. Right? Did God really say that? Did he really say, if you eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good, did he really say that? Right? Surely, you're, not, you're not surely going to die. Your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so Adam and Eve, they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in turn, they brought sin into the world. Well, when this happened, God questioned Adam. Right? And Adam very boldly went, oh, Eve. It was Eve's fault. Right? He just shifted the blame to Eve. Way to go, Adam. Okay? And so then God has a conversation with Eve, and she shares what the serpent did. Right? 
And so at this point, God declared war on Satan. Read it in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. At this point, there is a war that has been declared on Satan. Why are we surprised that Satan and his, his demons seek to attack God's people? Satan attacked Jesus continually while he was here on earth, and, and since then has been attacking God's followers. In John 14, Jesus shares with us that Satan is the ruler of this world. And if this is the case, anything that seeks to bring glory to God, namely followers of his, are going to anger Satan. With this being the case, it, it's not strange that we experience suffering because of the fall, because of sin, because of the spiritual battle that we are placed in the middle of. It's not strange that we face suffering. It would be strange if we didn't, right? We should flip our mindset on that. It would be strange if we didn't. So yes, Christian, welcome to Redeemer Church. Expect suffering. Don't, don't lose heart though. Right, just a couple chapters later, um, John 16, we need to be reminded that Jesus has already defeated Satan. Jesus has already defeated sin, death, and the grave. This is what he says. He says, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Right, take heart and be encouraged even in the midst of your suffering. Before we move on to verse 13 and 14, I, I want to pick up one more thing in verse 12. Peter said, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to what? What does it say? To test you. You guys are like, oh, okay, he's going to call me out. <laughs> don't fall asleep. Okay, don't fall asleep. To test you. Don't be surprised when it comes to test you as though something strange were happening to you. The fiery trial will come upon you to test you. This is God's plan. This is not by accident. These go hand in hand. Every time they go hand in hand. Persecution and trials lead to testing. Persecution and trials lead to testing. It's really hard to wrap our minds around, but that's, that's what God is doing. There's a reason. God has a plan. He has a purpose. Scripture tells us in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. We have to do a better job of embracing this idea than we naturally and normally do. See, t temptation and testing, they're different. Oftentimes we get them confused. Temptation and testing are not the same. God does not tempt us. In fact, when we are tempted, God promises to provide a way out. God tests us, right? Satan is the one who tempts us. E each of these, they're, they're meant to bring about a different result. I read it this way um, this week. I, I thought it was incredible. It said, Satan tempts us to bring out the worst in us, but God tests us to bring out the best. Satan tempts us so that the worst in us will come out. But God says, I'm going to test you, and it's going to bring out the best. Two different things, temptation and testing. God's going to test us. Right? His plan ultimately leads to glory. And so we need to seek to embrace suffering better than, than we do. All right, let's go ahead and, and continue on. Um, verse 13, well, let's, let's go back to verse 12. And we'll just read it all. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Verse 13, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. All right, so the first thing, we, we have to expect suffering as followers of Christ. The second thing, we need to rejoice in that suffering. Rejoice in that suffering. Don't, don't be surprised at the suffering, but rejoice in it when it comes your way. And you might be thinking, this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. And, and maybe to a non-believer it is. But to a believer, it shouldn't be crazy. It should not be crazy to us. 
Between verse 13 and 14, Peter said, rejoice, rejoice, be glad. You are blessed. How in the world am I meant to be glad and rejoice and be blessed in the face of suffering? I think there are four things that I want us to understand that take place in the midst of suffering. And I think these four things will help us to rejoice. Okay, number one, our suffering connects us with Christ. Our suffering connects us with Christ. Verse 13 said, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Paul, Paul shares this idea in Philippians of getting to suffer for the sake of Christ. And, and what a gift that it is. And I think this is, a, this is a weird idea. This is a weird statement. But I want to encourage you. Go have a conversation with somebody this week. Somebody who's been a Christian longer than you. Someone that you look up to. Someone who's a mentor in your life. And ask them that, that question. Right? How have you been able to suffer for the sake of Christ? And how has it been a gift in your life? How have you been treated the same way that the world treated Jesus? Right? Just looking around and, and locking eyes with a few people. It would be incredible conversations of what it means to suffer for the sake of Christ, right? Really understanding this identity as a little Christ, this, this name that we carry around, Christian. In the book of Acts, uh, Peter and the apostles are arrested and put in jail. And an angel of the Lord comes and releases them, and they go and they continue to preach about Jesus. And so they are called the next day uh, to come and give an account for what they're doing. And they are told uh, to stop preaching about Jesus. And their response, I love their response. They say that we must obey God rather than man. We're going to obey God rather than what you say. And so we're going to preach about Jesus. Right? And and so because of this, they are beaten and then they're let go. And and here's what happens in Acts chapter 5 verse 41. It says, then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They rejoiced because they were beaten for the name of Christ. Right, not only this idea, but the Lord himself is truly with us. Right, Paul speaks about this, how the Lord stood by him through, through all of his different aspects in ministry. Or what about if you look to the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They're thrown in the fiery furnace because they won't bow down to idols, right? And so they get thrown in this furnace, and what happens? They take a look into the furnace, and they say, didn't we throw in, didn't we throw in three guys? Why are there four in there? There are four guys in the fiery furnace, and one of them looks like a son of the gods, right? That was what was said. The Lord walked right through the suffering with them. But this should not surprise us because Jesus has promised to do this. We just forget sometimes. Right? Many of us have have memorized the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Right? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Right? And we we know that. That's not where, where Jesus ended. Right? What does it say? And behold... Well, let's go ahead and read it. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus has promised to be with us even in the midst of suffering. Right? Our our suffering brings fellowship with Christ. So much so to where it's actually Jesus who is the one who's being persecuted. Think about Saul in the early church, right? He's persecuting the early church. And Saul has this encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Right? You, you know the story. And, and Jesus says to him, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting them? Is that what he says? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? No, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Right? We have to understand that our suffering connects us with Christ. The second reason we need to rejoice in suffering is that our suffering will be transformed to glory. Our suffering will be transformed to glory. Verse 13 says, You may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. This can be a challenging one, but really it's not hard to understand. Jesus spoke of sorrow becoming joy uh, in John 16, and he actually used the illustration of childbirth. Now, my wife and I have three little boys who have all been born. 
one of them was born on a Wednesday, one of them was born on a Thursday, one of them was born on a Friday, and you might think I'm just an incredible dad, okay? You can look on a calendar and go back to the year your children were born and you can see what day as well. But I didn't do that, I actually do remember because it was weird. Um, one was born on a Wednesday, a Thursday, and a Friday. One of them was born with the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck three times. One of them was induced, so we knew when we were going to meet him. That was a weird feeling, like, hey, you want to have a baby tomorrow? <laughs> okay. Um, one of them was born during the FIFA World Cup, and so I got in a little bit of trouble because in between contractions and, and pushes, it was, okay, push, okay, take a break. And I would watch the game, and then she'd start pushing again, and so I went back here, yeah, honey, you could do it. And I watched the game, and so I got a little bit of trouble. I'll let you guys... Figure out which one was born on a Wednesday, which one was a umbilical cord, which one was induced, what, what that all looked like, right? Completely different births, all three of them. But what was the same what was what my wife did as these three boys were born into the world, right? The incredible pain that she went through, pain that I will never understand. Amen, ladies, right? <laughs> You're like, yeah, you don't know. You get a man cold and it takes you out for a week. I'll never understand. And if you've been in, in that moment, if you've been in that room, you've seen the pain and the agony that it has had to have been pushed through in that moment to birth these children. But what is so incredible is I think the next moment, the next moment where all of this pain seemingly is, has been transformed into joy, this moment where they take this little baby and they, and they place it right on the mom's chest and she holds this little baby. All this pain has now become joy, right? That's, that's the idea here of, of our suffering bringing glory in the future. Second Corinthians chapter 4, Paul puts it this way. He says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Right? If you're anything like me, you want to glorify God, but you don't always want to suffer for him. That's, that's the challenging piece because God is not going to replace the suffering with glory. Rather, he's going to transform the suffering into glory. He's not going to replace it with glory. He's going to transform it into glory. Right, when, when giving birth, my wife's pain was not replaced with joy. It was transformed into joy. Uh, on the cross, Jesus' pain was not replaced with glory. It was transformed into glory. And the same thing is true as we walk through suffering today. God will transform it into glory. All right, this, it's, it's a painful process, but it, it's the way in which God has designed it. And so, first off, our suffering connects us with Christ. Secondly, our suffering will be transformed to glory. And the third reason that we need to rejoice in suffering is because our suffering allows the Holy Spirit to care for us. Allows the Holy Spirit to care for us. Verse 14, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And I, I love this. I absolutely love this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unpack it a little bit for you and we can step into some of these things. But there's this idea that the Holy Spirit is already with you, right? Already a part of your sanctification process, leading to one day your glorification in heaven. And, and so what a blessing here on earth. But, but I think this phrase is more significant when we think about it in the face of persecution, right? Truly one of the greatest aspects as we walk through suffering and persecution. As, as we do this, the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon us, right? The same spirit that came to rest upon Jesus when he was baptized, the same spirit that has been promised to live inside of you. And I think that with our Western perspective, I think 2,000 years removed from when Peter wrote this letter, I think maybe not having a, a full grasp on different things of Judaism, that we, we tend to miss its significance when Peter says what he says. Right? Specifically in the Old Testament, there's this idea of Shekinah, right? And, and this word means dwelling or settling. This idea that we constantly see throughout the book of Exodus 
when speaking of the glory of the Lord, his Shekinah glory. So th- this idea in Exodus 24, when the law was given to Moses, we're going to spend a little bit of time in Exodus this morning. It says, then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And while he's here in Exodus 33, we see that Moses wants to see the glory of the Lord. And so this is what happens. The Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Right? God's glory was so amazing that Moses could only see his back. And the Bible tells us when Moses came down from the mountain, his face was shining. It was radiant from being in the presence of the glory of the Lord. So much so to where the the Israelites didn't want to step toward him, right? Because of how radiant his face was. The the glory of the Lord didn't stop there. If you fast forward to the, the tabernacle when it was completed in Exodus 40, it says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. If we fast forward to the temple being built and the Ark of the Covenant being brought in, this is what happens. It says, when the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Right? This is that, that idea of Shekinah. This, this dwelling, this settling, the glory of the Lord. And I think this is what Peter is referring to when he speaks of this in verse 14, when he says, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory, right? The spirit of God rests upon you. And you might say, that's cool, Travis. That was Old Testament stuff, right? But it's not. If we fast forward to the New Testament, Right? Think about the, the persecution that took place shortly after Jesus ascended into heaven. Right? The early church, if we, if we go to Acts chapter 6, we see the early church uh, has been growing and there is a need to um, have deacons, people stepping up within the church to serve the body of Christ. Right? And that's something that, that we are going to step into as Redeemer Church. Right? In, the, in the very near future, we are going to begin to have deacons uh, here as well. And so one of the deacons, what happens is the early church chooses seven people from amongst them. Right? And one of them, his name is Stephen. And Stephen uh, ends up giving a great defense for the faith. He is, he is seized on these faulty charges. And he gives this incredible defense for the faith. Um, and in, in Acts 6, verse 15, it says this, Gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Right? There was something different about him. This wasn't saying he was just really, really good looking as he sat there in front of the council. No, there was something different about him. There was something about his face. It was, it was glowing. It was similar to this moment that we read about in Moses. Right? The Holy Spirit was resting on him. And in Acts Seven, we see this incredible defense for the faith, the speech that, that Stephen gives. And I would encourage every one of us to go read through that this week because it's powerful and it's encouraging and it's challenging in our faith. But following the defense, the people end up stoning Stephen. And, and this is what happens. It says, now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God 
and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, right? This is significant. I think this is probably the only place in the Bible we see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Right? This is, this is Paul that we read about. And this next part is significant. It says, As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now my question is, how in the world does this happen? How in the world are you so bold in your faith? How in the world are you thrown in a pit and there is a group of people that take softball-sized stones and they hurl them at you until you die? And in that moment, you say, God, don't hold this sin against them. How do you do that? It's because the Holy Spirit is resting upon him in this moment of persecution, right? The glory of the Lord resting upon him. As we suffer for Christ, we don't have to wait for heaven to experience God's glory. Right? The, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. The Holy Spirit dwells on us. The Holy Spirit cares for us. This is exactly how Stephen persevered through this persecution. This is how countless followers of Christ persevere even today. Right? As, as we talked about the tabernacle and those things, right? the, the glory of the Lord dwelt in the tabernacle as God's people awaited the promised land. And the glory of the Lord dwells within us as we wait for the promise of heaven. It, it, is, it is absolutely significant. And so I pray that this week we see just how crucial it is to know that the Holy Spirit is caring for us. And so, one, our suffering connects us with Christ. Two, our suffering is transformed to glory. Three, our suffering allows the Holy Spirit to care for us. And the final reason that I think we need to rejoice in suffering is because our suffering allows us to glorify Christ. Verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ. Ultimately, that's what it's all about. Making the name of Christ known. All right? The name of Christ, it, it, it's not about my name. It's not about your name. It's not about his name or, or her name. There's only one name that matters. There's one name that will cause every knee to bow and every tongue to confess, and that's the name of Jesus. What's so, so funny today is I didn't introduce myself. Uh, most of the time I do, maybe a lot of the time I do, but really it doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter if you know my name. It doesn't matter if you remember my name. My name is, is not important in the grand scheme of life. If, if you never know my name, it doesn't matter. But if you don't know the name of Jesus, it has eternal ramifications for each one of us. Right? It's about the name of Christ. We, we should seek to bring glory to his name. Right? And suffering allows this to happen. As we persevere through suffering, we're able to bring glory to his name. I have a, a good friend who, who has done this. There's been a lot of suffering in his adult life, right? Walking through what it looks like to be abandoned by a spouse, what it looks like to be a single dad, right? Just walking through years of his life, suffering, right? You, you name it, there's been so much suffering, and yet there's so much depth to him. There's so much depth as a follower of Christ. I'm getting emotional because it's a big deal, but I get emotional because he's sitting amongst us right now. I'm not going to tell you his name because he would say the same thing. It's not about him. It's about Christ. There's so much wisdom. There's so much character. There's so much faith. And it's inspiring to me. I'm naturally drawn toward him. I want to have a faith like him. Right? Ultimately, his faith is strong because he's been with Jesus. There's this, this event that takes place in Acts chapter 4 that I've always loved. I've always loved reading about it. Peter and John, they're brought before the Sanhedrin because they have healed a man. And so they're, they're called to give an account for why they've done what they've done, how they've done what they've done. And this is what happens in Acts 4.13. It says, 
when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, which this is significant because this is the same Peter that we're reading about. This is the same Peter that just before this denied knowing Jesus three times. Jesus restored him. This is that same Peter. It says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Right? Another translation says that they're unschooled, ordinary men. They're astonished because they recognize that they had been with Jesus. And that's always fascinated me, that statement. They recognize they had been with Jesus. This is what I want said for me. He's an unschooled, ordinary guy, but there's something different about him. He's been with Jesus. That's what I want said to me. That's who my friend is that I'm telling you about. It's so evident that he's been with Jesus. It's so evident through the suffering in his life. It's refined him. It's refined his faith. And ultimately, it has brought glory to Christ. Every single time I talk with him, you see the glory that it's brought to Christ. So every time that we face persecution for his name, we have an opportunity to bring glory to him. Have you thought about that name lately? The name that you and I carry around, Christian, little Christ, it only appears three times in the Bible, right? One here in, in just a couple verses in 1 Peter chapter 4. Um, it, it appears in Acts chapter 11 when Barnabas is going to look for Saul. And it appears in Acts chapter 26 when Paul is sharing his conversion story with King Agrippa. It, it was originally a negative term that was given from outside the church, right? You little Christs, you Christian. And it became a term of endearment. You little Christ. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little Christian. I'm living out my faith. It was a term that was treasured. It's a significant name. It's a significant identity. And it's worth suffering for, and it's worth bringing glory to. Two, two uh, verses from now, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, says this, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. All right, so every time that we face persecution for his name, we have an opportunity to bring glory to him. This week I got to uh, read about the martyrdom of an early church father by the name of Polycarp. And maybe some of you are familiar with Polycarp and, and how he was martyred for the faith. Um, he lived in the second century and he was a disciple under the apostle John. And he was arrested for his faith ultimately and, and told that he would be put to death if he didn't denounce his faith. All he had to do was say that Caesar was Lord and they would let him go. And he didn't do it. In fact, his response was this. He said, 86 years I have served Christ and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And because of this response, he was martyred for his faith. He was burned alive. And there are many different aspects uh, to this martyrdom story that you can read. Um, a lot of amazing things. But the, the flames, uh, they, didn't, they didn't even get to him. They didn't burn him, right? And so they actually ended up stabbing him in the heart, and that was ultimately how he died. But what, what struck me was his response in the face of, of suffering, right? And this response that brought incredible glory to the Lord. And it had me, had me think through, as I go through suffering, am I as quick to glorify the Lord? Is that my response? When persecution happens, when suffering happens, for 24 years, I have served Christ, and he has never let me down. Why would I turn away from my King and Savior now? And I pray that that is my testimony. And some of you are sitting here, 24, math, Okay. I'm 36. I was 12 years old when I gave my life to Christ. 36 minus 12 is 24. That's why I say 24. I'm not 24. Right? I look awful for 24. I don't look too good for 36, okay? Going back, I want that to be said of me. Why, why would I deny Christ now? Just because it's hard. Just because there's persecution. Just because there's suffering. For 24 years, he's been nothing but good to me. I can't walk away. I can't turn my back that's what I want to be said of me. And hopefully that's what you want to be said of you as well. 
As we close, I want to share a, a little excerpt from a message that I read this week from John Piper. It says, uh, speaking about similar stories of other martyrs who died for their faith. He said, I have heard and read stories like these since I was a little child. Probably similar to a lot of us. We, we've read and we've heard stories like this our whole lives. He said, my recurring thought has not been, why does God let it happen? Because Jesus promised that it would. In Luke 21, verse 16, it says, some of you they will put to death. My recurring thought has been, could I stand it? Could I take the pain? Or would I try to rationalize a denial of Christ? I, I don't mean it, Lord. I just want to get free so I can serve you more. My, my children need me, Lord. I can do more good alive than dead. Would I be a coward? That was a question he asked himself. And he went on to share that he thought it was important to think about what you and I would do if we found ourselves in these situations. When, when we do this, we think about what it would be like to die for Christ. And in turn, it will allow us to better live for him. He said, a true Christian must be willing to say, I will not renounce Christ, even if it costs my life. But as soon as we say that, it makes it a whole, it makes a whole lot of things in our lives look ridiculous. I will die for you, but I can't find time to sit and read your teaching each day. I will die for you, but prayer doesn't seem real. I will die for you, but I can't talk to my coworker about you at work. I will die for you, but I can't support your cause with 10% of my income. He said one of the best ways to bring wonderful Christ-honoring changes into your life is to measure your way of life by your willingness to die for Jesus. As followers of Jesus, I want us to understand this today. We need to expect suffering. We need to expect it. And when it comes, we need to rejoice because it provides an opportunity to bring glory to Christ. Let me go ahead and pray for us. God, thank you for this morning. God, thank you for the suffering that you have placed before us. The suffering that you have used to test us. God, I, I thank you for the suffering that you have transformed into glory in each one of our lives. God, I ask that this week as we leave this place that we would be mindful to expect it. There's sin in the world. The, the fall that we read about, an enemy in Satan, we should expect suffering. But God, I ask that we would cling to you knowing that you have overcome everything. You have been victorious. So God, I ask that we would trust you in the midst of persecution, in the midst of suffering. And if this message is meant to be an encouragement to us because tougher times are coming, then God, I ask that it would be that. If this message is meant to be an encouragement to us so that we would better understand the persecution that, that others in the church face, then God, I ask that that would take place as well. God, I thank you so much for each and everything that you're doing in and amongst us, in and through us individually, and in your church. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen.